Israel is fascinating. A whole world in one country and a very special place in the hearts of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. A land with a remarkable history. Israel also attracts many people who want to learn more about the man who changed the course of history like no one else, Jesus. Who was this Jesus? Was he a guru, the founder of a new religion, a Jewish fanatic? You can visit archaeological digs and learn more about him. Archaeology has unearthed new insights into Jesus' life, into past events, personalities, and cultures. Through such excavations and research, we can uncover the meaning of history. You can visit biblical sites and walk where he walked, or read historical and theological books about Jesus. They all tell his story. But there's also another trail which is especially important. It leads directly to his people, the Jews, for they are Jesus' family. Here, Jesus was born and grew up. Here, he worked and taught. The Jews are Yeshua's family, his people. And the Jews play a key role in understanding Jesus because Jewish traditions have remained almost unchanged through the centuries. They've been handed down from generation to generation. Before we visit Yeshua's birthplace, let's go to Jerusalem's downtown area to discover whether Israelis today actually know where Jesus was born. Where Jesus was born. Jesus was born in Nazareth. Uh, Jerusalem. In Bethlehem. Uh, as far as I know, Jesus was born in Nazareth. Jesus in Bethlehem. Nazareth. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem lies south of Jerusalem in the hills of Jericho. It has never been a very big place. In fact, even today, the population is perhaps no more than 20 or 30,000 Christian and Muslim Arabs. Should this be the place where Jesus was born? Bethlehem lies on the border between fruitful fields and the barren desert. Nomads have crossed this arid land for centuries. On the other side are the farmers who till the ground. That's the way it's been for thousands of years. In the surrounding fields of Bethlehem, these scenes are straight out of the Bible. Shepherds herd their sheep in the same timeless way as some 2,000 years ago. When Jesus was born, shepherds on these very fields were the first to hear the news that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. Their ancient forefathers might have been using these caves. The New Testament tells how angelic beings appear to these simple nomads to announce the birth of Jesus. When the baby was born, they called him by the Hebrew name Yeshua. In the Bible, names hold tremendous significance. Yeshua means salvation. Jesus was the firstborn son of a Jewish mother. He was not the only child in the family of Joseph. The Bible tells us that Jesus later had brothers and sisters. But who were his brothers and sisters, his parents, his family? How important were they for him? We take part in a Brit Milah, the ritual of circumcision. The New Testament recounts that Yeshua was circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Jesus, like this modern Jewish infant, was initiated into Jewish life. Semitic peoples continue the requirement to circumcise their male children. This tradition goes back to the law of Moses, and for the Jews it is a sign for the covenant of Israel with God.
back to Bethlehem. The nomads, or Bedouin, who wandered through the desert, came here to trade their livestock for bags of wheat. The Hebrew word for Bethlehem is Bethlehem, which literally means house of bread. You have to get up very early in the morning if you want to visit a Bethlehem bakery. They prepare the dough to make the flat, round bread called pita. The stove is heated up and the pitas are baked just as they've been done here for centuries. And as the golden brown bread leaves the hot oven, the baker's delivery transport waiting outside hasn't changed much since the time of Jesus. In one of his later sermons, Yeshua said, I am the bread of life, meaning I, the man from Bethlehem, have come here to satisfy your hunger for life. If someone enters a relationship with me, he receives food for the soul, and this is far more important than food for the body. In Jewish tradition, the Hebrew language plays an important role in understanding the life of Yeshua. Linguists believe that Hebrew was a spoken language at the time of Jesus. It was certainly for a long time the language of the religious Jews. And thanks to them, this sacred language has been preserved. From generation to generation, it was copied and handed down. Today, Hebrew has been resurrected and is spoken in the streets and marketplaces of Israel. To know more about Yeshua's boyhood, we visit the town of Nazareth, where he grew up. Visitors to Nazareth today are somewhat disappointed that this noisy, traffic-congested place can bear any relationship to the idealized place where Jesus once lived. In a traditional Jewish family, the place of the mother hasn't changed much over the centuries. Here she welcomes the Shabbat day with a blessing. The Father blesses the food before the Shabbat meal. He is responsible for the spiritual welfare of his family and teaches his children to keep the traditions. The father, and even here the grandfather with his grandchild, have to make sure that the children learn to read the Torah, the five books of Moses. Here, the boy repeats the ancient creed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. You shall bind the word of God as a sign. These customary tefillin are little containers of scripture strapped on the forehead and arm with leather. Yeshua himself would likely have worn these devices to demonstrate the importance of God's Word. <laughs> Yeshua grew up in this kind of environment. To start off as a young Jewish boy, he would have attended a cheder class, something like a primary school where the teacher was a rabbi. It was known that at the time of Jesus, the Jews had already established a well-organized school system. If you visit such a traditional school today, you would see how Yeshua might have learned from the Torah, the scriptures. These Jewish young men are instructed by a rabbi how to read the holy book. Some even learn the words by heart. The life of a religious Jew revolves around reading, meditation, and discussion of the books of the Bible. That's why the Jews are called the people of the book. And it was this book that influenced Yeshua's life the most. Words of the famous Psalms are chanted in the religious services. 
Jerusalem is built as a city to which the people go up to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. These are the caves of Qumran, where parts of the Torah scrolls were discovered. Qumran lies below sea level in the desert near the Dead Sea. To the people of Israel, such scrolls are very important. At Mount Sinai, they receive the tablets of the law containing the Ten Commandments. Since then, the sacred words put down in writing have accompanied the Jewish people through history, from the desert to the Promised Land to Jerusalem and the Temple. The scrolls which have been found at the Dead Sea are kept in the Israel Museum. Jews and the Word of God are inseparable. His Word is a gift of love to the people. It's one of the great Shakespearean dramas of history is the Torah. The Torah, I'm looking at it as a historical book. It helped set up values, I would say. It formed the goals for my life. It's a way to lead your life and uh, you lead your lifestyle according to the book. It's part of, our, part of our heritage. It dictates what we do in the morning, what we do in the evening, what we do over a week, over a month, and over a year. In fact, the Torah is considered by many Jewish people a great gift from God, and they express their thankfulness by dancing with the scrolls. The joy of the law, or Simcha Torah, is a special Jewish holiday and the people are reminded of the importance of the Bible. If you approach Jerusalem from the north, your first vision of the city is toward the Mount of Olives. Dominating this angle is the Dome of the Rock, a shrine of Islam. Built at the site of the very ancient Jewish temple, which was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, the temple was a great monument. Witnesses of Jesus' time report that the roof and walls were covered with gold. At the time of Jesus, Jerusalem was surrounded by thick walls. Though its name means city of peace, Jerusalem has suffered a terrible fate. It has, during its long history, been destroyed no less than 17 times. In the time of Yeshua, people entered the city through one of the seven gates. In order to reach the Temple Mount, just as today, you had to go through one of the many narrow streets of the city. Jerusalem at the time of Yeshua was very cosmopolitan. It attracted people from all the nations, especially at the Jewish festivals. People visiting the temple would climb up these steps. They were designed in such a way that you can pause on every third step and recite a psalm. The New Testament notes that Yeshua's parents visited Jerusalem every year to celebrate one of the main Jewish festivals, Passover. This feast reminds the Jews of the Exodus when God brought their ancestors out of the land of Egypt where they had worked as slaves. Today, Jews from all over the world come to the Western Wall, the only remainder of the Temple. Here they celebrate a family feast with their sons, the Bar Mitzvah, meaning Son of the Covenant. This is a public confirmation of a young man's faith at the age of 13. At his Bar Mitzvah, he is entitled to make his free choice in matters of faith. He also has the privilege to read aloud from the books of Moses in public synagogue services. The New Testament records that when the young man Yeshua was visiting the temple, he talked to a group of learned and wise men. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding as well as his answers. He had come of age. Was this his bar mitzvah? We don't know. The Bible doesn't give any clues. All we do know is that he lived a normal life like any other Jewish young man.
Sephorus in the Galilee. Jesus probably visited the small neighboring town of Nazareth many times. He might even have been working here with his father Joseph on various carpentry assignments, although there's no mention of it in the scriptures. Here Jesus might have been challenged by Greek and Roman culture, by their pagan philosophies and ways of thinking. And it's possible that he spoke more than one language. Aramaic, which was widespread in this region, was heard along with Greek and Hebrew. But let's go back to Nazareth, the town where Yeshua grew up. This modern city lies in the hills of Galilee. Predominant is the Arab culture. Many Arab Christians live here. The Jews have settled in another part of the city. Nazareth attracts people from all over the world. However, not widely known is the fact that the first church was built here only in 570 AD, and it was originally a synagogue. Until the 6th century, Nazareth was still a Jewish town. When Yeshua grew up here, Nazareth was totally insignificant. Nazareth was a proverbial backwater. There was even a saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yet, in this provincial town, Yeshua spent his boyhood. But how did he grow up? Jewish tradition gives us an insight. It's likely that Yeshua studied the scriptures together with other young people in a Torah school, the Yeshiva, a Jewish institution whose roots go back to the time of Jesus. Two students would study together, ask each other questions and discuss them. The rabbi would intervene if the young men had to solve a difficult problem. Students were loyal disciples of their rabbis and spent much time in their company. Many rabbis had a whole group of people that followed them. Most of the rabbis were married and it was not uncommon for them to earn a living with a secular job, such as carpentry. That's exactly what Yeshua did. He learned the family trade of carpentry from his father Joseph. Here an Arab carpenter in Nazareth carries on that tradition Yeshua knew how to make furniture, doors, staircases. He knew how to earn a living. While Jesus prepared for his later ministry to preach and to heal, here he was a member of the community, like any other young Jewish man. He was part of the family of Joseph. He lived a normal everyday life, like thousands of other people. But could such a young man also be the Son of God? That's the question people have asked then and ask today. The New Testament makes it clear. The Son of God shared his life with people. From first-hand experience, he understands their sorrows, their everyday problems. Yeshua demonstrated that God is not a distant God, that God is interested in the everyday life of people, and He wants to be in the midst of it. To understand the spiritual preparation in the life of Yeshua, we must visit the desert, a place well known to Him. The desert played an important role in His life. For centuries, these Bedouin tribes have mastered life in the desert. They can survive in this dry, life-threatening wilderness. There are also Christian monks who are drawn to desert solitude. Many Orthodox monasteries have been built into the solid rock. Here they find peace and stillness without distraction. At the time of Yeshua, there were also religious communities in the desert. The most famous were the Essenes, who lived near the Dead Sea at Qumran. It was here that the famous Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. However, there are green oases in the desert, offering a refuge from the blistering heat. Here at Ein Gedi, for example, David hid from his rival, King Saul. David wrote a song about his desert experience. 
God, you are my God, whom I seek. My soul thirsts for you. My whole being faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where no water is. The New Testament records that Jesus also went to the desert to fast and pray. He stayed here for 40 days and nights. He was totally isolated from family and friends and faced hunger and thirst. Here he experienced what most human beings experience, loneliness and separation. But he learned to overcome in these difficult circumstances and still to trust in God. And he came out of it stronger and more equipped to face his public ministry. How was a wedding celebrated in Jesus' time? The evening before the big feast, the bridegroom went together with his friends to the house of the bride. They would take her to the bridegroom's home in a big procession. The night was spent singing and dancing. On the following day in the evening, the wedding ceremony took place. Until today, the celebrations such as this Yemenite Jewish wedding are similar to those in Jesus' time. It was at a wedding that Yeshua made wine from water. For some, that doesn't fit into the picture they have of the man from Nazareth. But everything Jesus does and says confirms. God is not a spoil sport, as many perceive him. The New Testament reports that Yeshua said, I have come that you may have life abundantly. We leave the festivities and look for some quiet spot at the Lake of Galilee. An important place in the life of Jesus. Here important decisions had to be made. Here he met his disciples. Here he healed people. Here was his home. At the lake, Israelis discovered this ancient boat, popularly labeled the Jesus Boat. It was discovered when the water of the Sea of Galilee was at a record low level from drought. It's an ancient fishing boat dating from the time of Jesus. Of course, we can't say for certain whether Yeshua sailed in or preached from this particular boat, but it is a typical vessel used by his disciples, the fishermen, some 2,000 years ago. Jesus spent a lot of time with Galilean fishermen at the lake. He lived like these people. Some of them even became his disciples. He perceived that they would be suitable to catch a harvest of people. It's this kind of people you encounter when you visit the lake. Fishing is still an important food source in the region, much as it was in Jesus' day. Even today, some Israelis and Arabs make their living catching fish. Let's go with two of them and look over their shoulders on a normal fishing day. Early in the morning is the time to catch most of the fish. The work is hard and they earn a meager living. Yeshua accompanied his disciples on their fishing trips. He shared his life with them. He experienced hard work and storms, but his vision for them was that they should not only catch fish, but real people through love. Yeshua sought down-to-earth people. He preferred the unpretentiousness of the uneducated. He gravitated toward the poor and the social outcasts. Sinners and tax collectors were his table companions. To them he entrusted the gospel, the good news, that God is here for all people. Not for the self-righteous, but for all, even people with mistakes and weaknesses.
With these disciples, he started a movement, the original Jesus movement that has spread throughout the world. Capernaum. These are the very impressive remains of an ancient synagogue built after the time of Jesus. It was in Capernaum where Jesus preached in such a synagogue. The New Testament says, On the Shabbat day he went to the synagogue and taught there, and they were surprised about his teaching, because he taught with authority. The word quickly spread that Yeshua healed the sick, that he said essential things about essential truths. He preached to the multitudes and ministered to the people of Capernaum. These were exhausting days. When he was tired, he withdrew to the solitude of these surrounding hills. Yeshua needed time to talk to God, to renew his strength. The people in Capernaum were simple, hard-working people and poor. Of the little money they earned, they had to pay considerable taxes. Many of them were unhappy. They thought things couldn't continue this way. Many waited for the Messiah the one the prophets had promised, who would deliver them. Was Yeshua going to be that Messiah? What was the object of Jesus' ministry? He describes it himself. I came to seek and save the lost. Yeshua is here on earth for the people who have lost sight of God and who they are. He's here for people who are sick in their bodies and their soul, who know they cannot help themselves. In the first part of this program, we explored the Bethlehem birthplace and the boyhood influences on Jesus in Galilee. We also saw the start of his public ministry and the tremendous heritage of the Jewish faith in his life, the scriptures and traditions of his people. We met Jesus' family, the Jews. In part two of Yeshua, Discovering the Real Jesus, we move into the fulfillment of his ministry and his destiny as Messiah as we participate in the Shabbat celebrations, the great Jewish festivals of Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. And we ask what goals Jesus had and what influence he had on people. As Yeshua was growing up, he probably helped his father to build the family sukkah. This temporary booth, both for eating and sleeping, is constructed each autumn during the Feast of Tabernacles to remind the Jews of their wilderness experience of 40 years sojourning in tents. It was only natural that Yeshua celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with his family. He was part of the celebration. He was eating and singing with his brothers and sisters, and also sleeping in the sukkah, probably a very special experience and adventure. To get a sense of the sukkah's meaning, we visit some Israeli Bedouin who maintain that desert sojourn experience even today. As you watch, you cannot help but think of how the people of Israel wandered through the wilderness. Journeying through the desert still holds a fascination in the consciousness of the Jewish people. It's the story of their deliverance. The people of Israel lived as slaves in a foreign land until their leader Moses brought them out of Egypt with God's help. For the Jews, God is the one who delivered them from bondage. Yeshua was told this impressive story every year, and thanks to the Feast of Tabernacles, the memory of this event doesn't get lost.
These Bedouin have been living for generations in tents. The population is continually decreasing as the encroaching modern world pushes them away and restricts their freedom to move about. The way the Bedouins live today gives us a few clues as to how the people of Israel wandered through the desert. During the Feast of Tabernacles, you see thousands of temporary booths decorating apartment balconies in Israel. The sukkah is never meant to be a permanent building. It should remind the people of Israel of their temporary dwellings, where they wandered through the desert. Every autumn in Israel, families spend time together in these booths. They sing, eat, and sleep under the stars in these tabernacles. Wandering through the desert, they didn't own any land. They couldn't harvest their own crop. They were dependent on God. When they reached the Promised Land, this changed. The Feast of Tabernacles was to remind them, don't forget where you came from. At the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews also gather for a joyful march through the streets of Jerusalem. Everybody's invited. As a visitor, you almost can't escape it. And you'll notice that this feast is certainly not just for the Jews, but it's a prophetic event that many Christians are discovering today. Believers of Yeshua come to visit Jerusalem and take part in the feast march every year. There are people who have been reading the Old Testament and are aware of the prophet Zechariah's prediction that nations will come up to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast together with the Jews. There's a growing awareness of this Old Testament feast as a legitimate part of the Christian faith. At the age of 30, Yeshua said goodbye to his family in Nazareth and began the life of an itinerant preacher and healer. Sleeping under the stars and living under the total provision of God would be familiar to Jesus and his disciples, and every Jew who spent time living, praying, and meditating in a sukkah. When you walk through the streets of Jerusalem on a Friday afternoon, you very soon discover there's less and less traffic, that bus lanes are emptying and the city is becoming quieter. You feel a special atmosphere. Great expectation is in the air. When you ask the people, they are looking forward to Shabbat in a special way. Shabbat is a day that I look forward to all over the week. Actually, I feel that it's more of a gift that God has given us that he gave us a day of rest and a, a break from everything else. I think it's a most important day for the family to be all together. Everything is uh, quiet and uh, nobody works. It's a great day. I mean, we look forward. Uh, it's just a, a whole different level of consciousness than what we could have the rest of the week when everyone is running and trying to do and trying to get and trying to accomplish and everything else. To us, it's the holiest day it could be. The streets are swept clean. People prepare themselves for Shabbat inside and outside. Silence descends. The religious quarters are closed off to traffic. It's Friday evening. Very soon, Shabbat begins. These Torah students stroll to the Western Wall before sunset for a short religious service. Jewish families are preparing for Shabbat. They clean the home, tidy the kitchen, prepare the food for the festive Shabbat meal. 
Children take a bath and put on the Shabbat dress. They hurry to meet the deadline of sunset when Shabbat begins and all work must end. Now the father goes with his son to the synagogue to pray. Of course, they leave the car at home. During the synagogue service, the women of the house welcomes the Shabbat with a blessing. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us and commanded to light the Shabbat candle. When the father and son return home, they greet each other with a blessing. The father says or sings the blessing over bread and wine. Over the centuries, the Shabbat has begun the same way. Shabbat is the most important holiday in Judaism. In very much the same way, Jesus celebrated the seventh day of the week with his family. There's a saying that the Jews have not kept the Sabbath as much as the Sabbath has kept the Jews. The Shabbat is for everybody for employees, for strangers, even animals. The Shabbat is a protection against material slavery. Striving after success, prestige, and wealth are put aside so that people can meditate on the spiritual side of life. Not everywhere it's that peaceful and quiet. Go to Tel Aviv and you'll find the city is full of noise. The streets are buzzing with activity. Nothing like the tranquility of Jerusalem. Two towns in the same country which couldn't be more different. Saturday morning, Shabbat, a relative calm even descends on the hectic pace of Tel Aviv. On Shabbat, the Orthodox Jews close off their communities. No traffic should disturb the peace and quiet. For the traditional Jews, this day is an expression of faith in the one God who created everything and rested on the seventh day. This was true for Yeshua. For him, the Shabbat was for the good of the people, when you slow down and enjoy the Shabbat, you realize what a difference a day of rest makes, because everybody needs an island where he can rest more than ever. We visit a religious school, the yeshiva, where rabbis gather a group of students around themselves. Each rabbi teaches his followers how to study the Bible and the Jewish commentaries. This tradition stems from biblical times. The word yeshiva means sitting, and while sitting the students read the scriptures and discuss their contents. The teaching method in the yeshiva is for two students to study together, asking each other questions. One argument is met by counter-argument, sometimes in a heated discussion. Study continues from the earliest childhood to their deathbed. They are a people of the book. They are living with the word. Rabbis tutor their students individually. The mutual life is more than an academic transfer of knowledge. It takes place in a close fellowship. Together with his rabbi, the student learns how to apply the spiritual principles to the specific situations of everyday life. Jesus was also a rabbi. In fact, rabbi is not necessarily an academic title. Any layman could be a rabbi if he possessed the necessary spiritual authority and qualities of a leader and a deep understanding of the Torah and in later times of the Talmud. Rabbi was above all a title of respect. Yeah. 
The students of Rabbi Yeshua were ordinary people. He asked them to accompany him on his travels. He demonstrated how God intended people to live together. Jesus founded, so to speak, a lay movement of people who desire to live according to the Word of God. At the time of Yeshua, it was quite unusual for a rabbi not to marry. Celibacy was never a part of their thinking and way of life. However, rabbis would usually marry quite late and not at the age of 30, as was Yeshua when he began his ministry. It was also not uncommon that women should travel with a rabbi and be a part of the group of disciples. Two of his female disciples are known by name, Mary and Martha. They lived together with their brother Lazarus in Bethany, a place near Jerusalem. Today their home is a church. Jesus was refreshed by their hospitality on his way to Jerusalem. The New Testament reports that Mary, or Miriam in Hebrew, used to sit at the feet of Rabbi Yeshua. She wanted to learn more about his teaching about God's plan for the world. She took time to listen to Jesus, and he commended her for this. The Torah was written in Hebrew, which, like Arabic and Aramaic, reads from right to left. Technically, this is because inscriptions are hewn in stone. Holding his chisel with his left hand and the hammer in his right hand, the stonemason could always see the letters he was writing. Until this day, the Torah is written by hand on specially prepared parchment. Scribes need meticulous training to write the letters in equal size and spacing. Also, the ink must be mixed according to an ancient prescription. It's applied with a thick consistency, but the ink must not crumble off when the parchment is rolled up. The Hebrew language is written only with consonants. The vowels have to be imagined. Therefore, you need a wide vocabulary to discern the different stems and roots of the words. Such a Torah scroll is extremely costly. It's a great honor to carry the Torah scroll from the shrine to the lectern during a synagogue service, where the cantor reads from it, or more correctly, sings from it. Yeshua stressed how important God's word is, but he also called into question its narrow and rigid interpretations by some of the pious people of his time. His concern was to show the deeper meaning of the spiritual truths of the Torah. You'll better understand the stories Yeshua told if you travel through the country. Then you discover that Jesus took many of his parables from everyday objects. For example, he spoke of himself as a door. Jesus spoke about bread, the bread of life. He spoke about a city on a mountain, a city that would be seen from afar. Sometimes people might have smiled or even burst into laughter at the simple example of his stories. Jesus told the story about the owner of a vineyard who went out early in the morning to hire people to work for him. After agreeing with them for the daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Then he went out again and hired more workers. Later, he found still more workers waiting, and he hired them. When the day was finished, the manager paid all the workers the same amount. Those who had begun first thought this was unjust and criticized the master. But he replied, am I not free to give as much as I want to whom I want? Yeshua also used the imagery of water. He said, if a man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, 
Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of water. Yeshua grew up in this hot and dry climate and appreciated the vitality of water. But he also knew people needed spiritual drink to refresh themselves, the living waters of the Holy Spirit. The wine in Israel is choice. The reason for its excellent quality lies in the fertile soil and also in the many hours of sunshine. Yeshua used the imagery of grapes, the vine and the vineyard in his parables. For example, I am the vine, you are the branches. In that way, you can be related to me. When you visit Israel during the months of November and December, you might be invited to the Festival of Lights, or in Hebrew, Chanukah. This popular holiday is celebrated in Israel in the wintertime, when the nights are long, and it's even cold here. This feast reminds Israel of her liberation from the Greek yoke when the temple was rededicated. Candles were lit, one more every day for eight days. These candelabras have eight arms, plus a ninth called the shamash, or servant. This ninth candle serves to light all the others. Messianic Jews believe this servant candle to be a type of Yeshua. He is the servant bringing light into the world. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Messiah, the light of the world. Who has given us the Messiah, the light of the world. Messianic Jews also believe in Yeshua as their Messiah and they celebrate this Jewish feast because their Lord also celebrated it. To understand the ministry and work of Jesus, we visit a Jewish family during the time of Passover or Pesach as it's known in Hebrew. Before people celebrate Pesach, the Feast of Redemption, they have to make thorough preparations. To the housewife, shopping for the feast is especially important. Not a thing must be forgotten. She buys all the special foods that have a symbolic significance for Pesach. For the celebration, the housewife buys nuts as well as raisins to mix with apples and wine. These form a thick mush. The mixture reminds them of making mortar and bricks in Egypt. At the vegetable market, she'll buy bitter herbs to remind them of the bitter fate of slavery. Of course, wine belongs to the feast. Very popular is a sweet wine. The Pesach supper is more than just a meal. It's a special ceremony with a liturgy. The celebration aims especially to educate the children. In turns, they read from the Seder book, containing all the instructions to celebrate the feast. They eat the food that alludes to the events of the exodus from Egypt. The father leads the celebration. He says the blessings. It's the father's task to convey the story of the Exodus, of Israel's liberation from slavery. He does this very skillfully in a responsory song with questions and answers. Pesach is a happy feast with a lot of singing, and the family stays up late. In another place, not far from Jerusalem, the ancient race of the Samaritans, who are akin to the Jews, still celebrate Pesach in their own way. 
On Mount Gerizim, they bring an offering to God, very similar to Old Testament times. They are reminded of the night before the exodus from Egypt, when all the family sacrificed a lamb. As one group begins to pray, the other prepares the animals for the ceremonial meal in big ovens. After a few hours, each family takes a portion of the meat back home, where they dine with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples. He ate with them the lamb, the bitter herbs, and the unleavened bread, thinking about the exodus from Egypt. He would have been reclining a table in Hebraic fashion, rather than sitting up as imagined in famous paintings. Later on during the supper, Yeshua took the unleavened bread and the wine. He blessed it and broke it to his disciples and asked them to remember him. At the Passover table, Yeshua instituted what Christians call the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. This symbolic meal is celebrated by Christians all over the world to commemorate Jesus as the final Passover Lamb of God. What happened in the final dramatic days of Jesus' ministry on earth? The New Testament recounts that his mere presence, his teachings, his criticism of the religious hypocrites, his disputes with the learned men were all a challenge to the establishment. He was accused of blasphemy because he claimed to be the Son of God. An overnight plot was hatched to be rid of him. He was sentenced to death by the Romans and killed on a cross. Here in the old city of Jerusalem, Christians built churches some ancient, some modern, but each one emphasizing a special moment in Jesus' life. As you observe one of these processions, you discover that Christian denominations have mainly concentrated on the last days in the life of Jesus. Benedicta tui mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui Jesus. Pilgrims reenact the events of his way of the cross down to the smallest detail. These Christians walk up the Via Dolorosa and remember their master. While only a short distance away, contemporary life goes on as usual. These are two worlds side by side. You wonder if there's a link between the two. What do Christians know about Yeshua's family, the Jews? What do Jews know about their most famous native son and family member, Yeshua, who died in Jerusalem? Let's see what the people who live here think about him. He was a Jew, he was born as a Jew, and then he changed the religious. I don't know if he became Christian, maybe the followers became Christians. When he had a disagreement with the Pharisees, the rabbinical Jews of those days, he broke off and created a, a new sect, originally the Essenes and then later the Christians. He was uh, very kind and very, uh, he was a miracle worker. Peaceful, prophetic, rabble-rousing. I think he was a good man and because of it, uh, a lot of people are going uh, after him. He, he preaches for goodness, for love between among people, for uh, forgiveness. And he brought a good message to the world, I think quite wide, and it looks like it works in a, for a lot of people. Young Armenian students on their way to the Holy Sepulchre. Several Christian denominations claim to be a part of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, constructed over the hill of Calvary, where tradition has it that the cross once stood. The New Testament records that Jesus was crucified outside the city. So why is this landmark now inside the city walls? The explanation is simple. The town was destroyed many times and rebuilt, and with it, the walls were expanded. This could be the garden where Yeshua was buried. The Bible tells us that after Yeshua's death, a wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea, asked permission to bury Jesus in the tomb of his own garden. Usually the dead are buried within 24 hours in Israel. The hot climate makes the corpses decay quickly. 
Yeshua was wrapped in two white linen shrouds. Jews bury their dead without a coffin. And then he was placed in the tomb. How did Yeshua's story continue? The New Testament reports that Yeshua's disciples came early on the first day after the Shabbat to the tomb. In fact, the first to come were some Jewish women. They were astonished to find the tomb empty. Slowly, Yeshua's followers began to understand what had happened, and they recognized the truth, which is still characterizing the faith of those who believe in Yeshua. He is not dead. He is risen. Death didn't have the last word. God's love for humanity had not died. The door to eternal life had opened. And that door has a name. Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And the story continues beyond the resurrection. The New Testament recounts that Yeshua appeared to quite a number of people, at one time even up to 500. Many Jews believed in Him. In Jerusalem, several thousand. And with these Jewish believers began a movement that has spread across the whole world and still exists today. Who was Jesus? With this question, we started on our journey of discovery. No doubt, Jesus was a Jew. He grew up in the Jewish culture. He was a part of a Jewish family. He was a rabbi who taught the people how to cope with the problems of life. And he also maintained that he was the Son of God, the only way to God. With this claim, he divided his contemporaries. There were those who followed him and those who denied his claims. He also said, whoever believes in me shall live forever. With this statement, Yeshua not only challenged the people 2,000 years ago, but he also challenges us today. Every one of us must face the question, who really is this Jesus?